From the Toronto Star, I'm Adrian Chung, and this matters. In the second COVID summer, how safe is it to be outside? What I mean by that is, what are the chances of you catching COVID while being outdoors? We've known for more than a year that indoor spaces are often vectors for infection, poor ventilation, aerosol particles that hang in the air, people being bunched up and not distancing. So what happens when you eliminate most of those factors in the fresh air? Are there any documented COVID cases from outdoor distanced activities? How has the science changed? and how we understand transmission. We're looking into that with Dr. Suman Chakrabarty, infectious disease doctor at Trillium Health Partners in Mississauga, to help answer what your risks are for a summer spent outside. Dr. Chakrabarty, thanks for your time. It's great to talk to you again. Great to be here again. The weather is starting to turn around. We are headed into summer again. I think for most people, myself definitely, cannot wait to be outside after being cooped up all winter. But it can be complicated, right? Because we're weighing the risks and the factors of being outside. What do we know at this stage about outdoor transmission of COVID? First of all, I want to echo your point about just feeling cooped up all winter. And, you know, even before COVID, this has always been a time of hope and, you know, reopening, being outside in the warmth. And that's going to happen again this year. You know, this is the big thing that we're thinking about in terms of outdoor transmission and with COVID. And I think that what we do know after one year and more of being into this, we know that outdoor transmission, whereas the risk is not zero, it's almost zero. It is extremely small. And I think that's important that going forward, we not base our recommendations on abstinence. We know that doesn't work in, for example, sexual health, public messaging, HIV, it didn't work either. We have to give risk mitigation strategies. And just by being outside, you cut the risk of transmission by so much that even if there's an odd transmission here and there, it's not resulting in, in, for example, a massive outbreak or people being rushed to the hospital. That's what we are actually looking for. And that's why being outside is such a good thing. Plus, you have the added benefit of it's warm, it's good for mental and physical health. So the jury is in then. Outdoor is much, much safer than being indoors with other people. That's exactly right. You know, we have multiple studies showing this. There was an Irish study that was done showing that it's something like the chances one in a thousand. We've had articles talk about numbers and saying, for example, less than 10%. But when you actually look closer into it, that's not actually what things were saying. It's that uh, most of these situations where you do see a transmission, it was an outdoor indoor mixed event, for example, like a backyard barbecue. And the transmission is actually occurring indoors, not outside. Right. So in your experience, then, even in this third wave, the people who are coming into the hospital sick, they're not getting it from being outside, right? Like this is happening at workplaces. This is happening where people are indoors for a long time. This has shown itself repeatedly. That's exactly right. In the third wave, especially, and we saw it also, you know, in the first and second wave with long-term care, but the people who are coming into hospital are not people who've just been exposed to COVID. They've had heavy exposure and that almost without exception, actually, probably without exception, is happening in a prolonged contact in an indoor space. We're not seeing people that are coming from Trinity Bellwoods Park. We're not seeing people that are coming, you know, because they're walking down the street together. We're seeing people that are coming from crowded workplaces and, of course, the the homes uh, where they live. And this makes sense. And that's, I think, another thing that we don't talk about very often is that even if something does happen outdoors, it's unlikely to be a heavy exposure. It's the heavy exposure that I think lead to people getting extremely ill, especially young individuals. And, you know, we have been concentrating our efforts on that, the vaccination campaign. But I really wish the messaging from public health would uh, have that as the stress and more of let's be outside because that really, really cuts the risk to essentially vanishing these small numbers. The New York Times, they had a report that zeroed in on a specific number that the CDC in the U.S., put out on outdoor transmission. And that number that they've been using is that it's, quote, less than 10% of COVID cases can be traced back to an outdoor setting. But again, the reporting says that this number is misleading, like it is specifically less than 10%. But the reporting in talking to infectious disease doctors is that it's much less than 10%. Can you explain that? 
Yes, yeah, so that, that's exactly right. So like it, technically it's true, it's less than 10%, but it's actually probably more or less than 1%. But her name escapes me right now, but the actual primary investigator of that study has come out publicly and said, when somebody interpreted 10% from our study, that's not at all what we were saying. And for example, when they were looking at the different clusters of uh, outbreaks, the what was called indoor, what was called outdoor wasn't uh, consistent across these different studies. And a lot of time construction sites, they were classified as outdoor, whereas there was a very significant indoor component, which is likely where the transmission was occurring. So, you know, when you kind of put this all together, plus real life evidence, you know, uh, we had massive political protests last year. Trinity Bellwoods is famous in Toronto now. The city said thousands came to the park, lured by the weather. As soon as the sun came out, I said, "That's it's done now. The Texas Rangers opening game. We have all these examples of these big outdoor gatherings that didn't really result in any major blip in transmission. And I think that's why we're a year in. Let's open up outdoor stuff because this is going to be good for everybody, especially that we have at least another two weeks of lockdown, which I hope will be lifted soon too. So essentially, the takeaway here should be that if you are outdoor, you are distanced, the likelihood of catching COVID is very low. And then even a casual encounter like passing somebody on the sidewalk, that risk is even lower, is what you're saying. That's exactly right. I think that the risk is almost zero. I'm even skeptical that if you're in close contact with somebody outdoors, you know, assuming you're not like coughing in each other's faces, let's uh, take that out. But I'm skeptical that even a close conversation results in risk, just given the fact that when you're outdoors, ventilation is perfect. I remember in the early days of the pandemic, you know, there was a lot of concern over surface area transmission, which was reasonable. Like we were still figuring out how COVID spread, where people were getting it, what were the avenues. We've now learned that that is very rare. Again, not zero, just as in outdoor transmission, but in comparison, the risk is very low and rare. And, you know, there was a lot of talk about hygiene theater, that we're focusing on the wrong things focusing on situations that are low risk over situations that are high risk. And I wonder, do you see any parallels to how we talk about outdoor transmission right now? Absolutely do. And, you know, it's funny, over a year into this, you'll talk about places like companies, for example, that have had an outbreak. And the first thing they mention before talking about ventilation and spacing and, you know, mask wearing, they talk about, you know, deep cleaning. I still to this day don't know what deep cleaning is. Right. <laughs> you hear it all the time, but you're absolutely right. I think that there is a uh, disproportionate focus, there was at least, on surface transmission, people washing their hands, people wearing gloves, people doing all sorts of things that were trying to avoid touching surfaces, whereas that was not where the massive bulk of transmission is occurring. And we're seeing that same thing with outdoor transmission, where there's a disproportionate focus. And uh, I call this visibility bias because you can see 100 people hanging out in a park in Trinity Developments, but you don't see groups of 10 people indoors transmitting to each other at a much higher rate. We'll be right back. This leads into what you were talking about before, that it's not about a one-size-fits-all strict policy, especially if the science doesn't necessarily back that up but it's about harm reduction of what is a lower risk activity. That's also exactly right. I think that especially with the outdoor transmissions, I hear a lot of what ifs. Well, what if those teenagers who are outdoors playing basketball breathe on each other? What if this? What if that? And the thing is that, you know, when you're looking at these, there could be a risk there, but the overall risk of just being outdoors has massively reduced. And think about this. Let's say if you had 10 kids outdoors getting some exercise playing basketball, and people are saying, what if, well, how about I give a what if is what if those same teenagers were downstairs in their basement drinking with each other? Fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But I'm saying that in terms of COVID, they have a much higher risk of transmitting to each other. Right. So again, I, I understand why people want to think about it in terms of percentages. Like what, what is the risk factor here? And, and what you've been saying is, again, not zero risk. There's not zero risk of being outside, but it's much, much lower than spending time indoors for a prolonged period with people. 
Right. And, you know, I think also, you know, the last year we've had a laser focus on COVID. This is the, the uh, first pandemic for many of us in our lifetime. So I, I totally get it. But we really have to kind of take a look at the big picture now. And, you know, we've heard so many stories about mental health, physical health declining. And right now we have an amazing opportunity to help both of those things with the good weather. And I'll tell you one thing, I'm going to be outside a lot this weekend. There's also news coming from the southern border about the CDC in the U.S. They've essentially lifted the mask mandate for vaccinated Americans in most situations. Dr. Fauci, a lot of Americans put a lot of trust and faith in you. So my first question is really of a personal nature. Do you feel good about this mask decision today? Would you have preferred that you wait a bit longer? No, actually, that's why I feel very good about it. And I'm very much in favor of it. People who've been vaccinated now, they really do need to get the feel that we're approaching some form of normality. What are your initial thoughts on that? I know that there's some controversy around that, too, that not everybody agrees with that. But your thoughts on that? And is it possible that we might see something like that in Canada soon? I think this is a good policy, given where the U.S. is in their pandemic, as well as their vaccination campaign, which is certainly far ahead of ours. This said, this is an important aspect just to demonstrate that, look, we know in real world studies, real world observations that Trump any study, to be honest with you, is the vaccines are very safe and effective. They're effective not only for reducing your own risk of extreme illness from COVID, but also for transmission. So putting that together, I think what's puzzled me about Canada is that there's been a bit of a reluctance to give that concession. So, you know, if somebody has a vaccine, it should change what they do. I understand that when we're in a transition period, you don't want people throwing off their masks all at once. I get that. And I think that we really need to right now hold off a little bit. But looking forward, I'm not seeing any guidance on what people who are fully vaccinated can do, have one dose can do. And that's something that we really should be addressing because it is a lot safer once you've had you know two weeks after your first vaccine or if you're fully vaccinated. And that's what I think is being reflected in the CDC guideline because it's following what scientific evidence we have. I'm happy to see them do that. And I hope we do follow at some point next month when it's going to be a different story for us. I know this is a common question, too, that's sort of an aside of what we're talking about in terms of being outdoors. Again, not everybody has been vaccinated. Not everybody has even had their first dose yet. But should people still be masking outdoors? What situation should we be doing that? For outdoors, I would say there's really no good evidence that masking helps. I know they say, the guys say, if you're going to be in close space with somebody, you can, if you choose to wear a mask there, Go ahead. I would never shame anyone wearing a mask outside, but to be honest with you, based on the data that we have, I don't think it's necessary. But indoors, yeah, still like what you see in the CDC, that if you're fully vaccinated and you're with other fully vaccinated people, there's no reason to wear a mask. And that actually makes sense. But right now in Canada, we're not quite there yet. So it makes sense to wear masks if you're indoors. And that's, I think, what most Canadians are still doing at this point. We are starting to see some dropping numbers in the third wave, at least in Ontario. Fingers crossed that this holds. Vaccinations, of course, play a huge and critical role in protecting people and giving immunity. Is there a good reason for hope then that this summer might be okay? That if people stay outdoors and distance as much as possible, like are we in perhaps better shape than we were last year? Again, lots of caveats, but fingers crossed. What do you think? I've never lost my hope. Even before the third wave came, I've never lost my hope because you're seeing the situation here as different because of vaccination. We're in the vaccination era now. You know, what's happening right now compared to a year ago is extremely different. We are coming out of the third wave. I completely agree with you. Hospital capacity is still stretched. So we want that to decompress a bit. We have to now remember we have vaccines that take a disease that was putting so many people in hospital and making it essentially into a cold. And that really changes things. So I know that we have to to kind of switch from the mindset that we're worrying about all these transmissions where, look, when you have a significant amount of people with vaccines, if you have a transmission, okay, you might have a sniffle for a day. You might not have any symptoms whatsoever. But the point is you're not getting a deluge of hospitalizations. And that's what we worry about. That's the reason why we closed the community to begin with. And I think one big thing is, is that, yes, I think the summer is going to be a lot more normal than last year with maybe still still some restrictions, but they'll slowly come off. But remember that because people are covered with vaccines, even if we have an increase in cases, the threat of a lockdown is not going to be over us because we're not worried about those people being hospitalized. Dr. Jacques Rabardi, I don't know about you, but the past year of the pandemic 
it feels like both a slog and a blur. Like time has compressed and it's expanded and at times it's lost all meaning. I know I'm getting a little existential here, but do you ever look back as an infectious disease doctor and do you think about how much we have learned about the virus in the past year? Oh, definitely. I think that we've learned so much about the virus. I think we've learned a lot about ourselves. I know I've learned a lot about myself as well. And one big thing too is that you know systems in terms of, for example, weaknesses in our healthcare, weaknesses in our policy decisions, and strengths as well. And I think that this actually happened after SARS back in 2003 slash four. And there, a lot of these lessons were actually documented in a plan, a pandemic plan. We actually didn't use a lot of that, unfortunately, at the beginning. So I think that um, we really need to, once this is over, which is going to be soon, to really have a reckoning and looking back and things that we did well things that we didn't do well and learn from it, not just from pandemic standpoint, but from other health aspects about ourselves. And if this ever happens in the future, so we can do it. So there's not as much of an impact on the community. Dr. Chakrabarty, thank you again for your expertise, for walking us through this. And again, fingers crossed that we have a summer ahead of us. Summer's coming. It was a pleasure to be here and uh, stay safe. We'll uh, hopefully talk over a beer in person soon. I'd love that. And that is Dr. Suman Chakrabarty, infectious disease doctor at Trillium Health Partners in Mississauga. I'm going to volunteer him for the first round on the patio, but I got the second. That's it for today. Thanks for listening. This Matters is hosted and produced by me, Adrian Chung, Sabah Aitizaz, and Raju Mudhar. Produced and mixed by Sean Patton, and her director of programming is JP Fozo. Our show theme music is by So Called, and our episode music is by Mike DeAngelis. We want to hear what stories matter to you. Please send us comments, questions, or ideas to This Matters at the star.ca. Please consider supporting the journalism the Toronto Star Newsroom does at the star.com. And don't forget to subscribe to This Matters on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Let's talk soon.